Well, good morning. We are uh, continuing our study this morning on the biblical family. And last week, Bruce went over the role of the husband and his duty with regard to the family and his wife. Two weeks ago, uh, we studied God's blueprint for marriage and the purpose of it. We saw that man in and of himself was incomplete, lacking in something. It was not good for man to be alone, therefore a woman is created to fill that which is lacking in him. The purpose of marriage was that of companionship. And I just want to say that this is evidence of Bruce being much wiser than me. When we discussed what we'd be speaking on, Bruce said, I will talk about what the man is to do. You take the women. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> so, it seems like there's a lot of women here today. I don't know. This is not normal, right? But, as my wife said, tread lightly. Tread lightly. But uh, we see in the Genesis account of creation that there was another purpose for a God creating a woman for man. That of companionship and she was to be a suitable helper for him, Genesis 2.18. Man was to serve God by doing the work that he entrusted unto him, and woman was to serve God by aiding her husband in this work. We can see that there's no conflict between husband and wife here in the Genesis account. There was no confusion or dissatisfaction with that role. And it's not until Genesis chapter 3 that Adam and Eve sin against God and bring about sin into the world. We read God's words to the woman. He says, I will surely Multiply, multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring four children. So it's not the guy's fault, ladies. I always say, this is your fault, you did this to me. No, that was Eve. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Here we see that there's a shift in desires. The phrase, your desire shall be for your husband, means that her desire is to dominate her husband and usurp his role and position as head of the household. And we have no better example of that than what we see in our culture today, do we not? The 60s brought about the rise of feminism. Now, when we think about feminism, what do we think about? Usually, we just think of it was mainly just equality for women, women to have a voice, uh, women to be able to to vote and, and, and do all these things and just be equal with men. Now, I'm not denying that there have been injustices toward women over the, over the years. The fact that women did not start earning the right to vote until the 20s is a blight on our society. But it's important that we understand the true motive behind the feminist movement. Linda Gordon, who was a major influencer of the feminist movement in the 60s, and who is currently a New York University history professor teaching our young people said this. She said this in 1960. Quote, the nuclear family must be destroyed and people must find a better way means of living together. Whatever its ultimate meaning, the breakup of the families is now an objective revolutionary process. No woman, hear this, no woman should have to deny herself any opportunities because of her special responsibilities to her children. Families will finally be destroyed only when a revolutionary social and economic organization permits people's needs for love and security to be met in ways that do not impose divisions of labor or any external roles at all." End quote. Declaration of Feminism 1974 says, Marriage has existed for the benefit of men and has been a legally sanctioned method of control over women. We must work to destroy it. The end of the institution of marriage is a necessary condition for the liberation of women. 
Therefore, it is important for us to encourage women to leave their husbands and not live individually with men. That is feminism. <clears throat> well, you might say that was back then. Things have changed. That's not no longer the desire of society. I don't know if you were aware of this, but even the movement Black Lives Matter on their website up until just a few months ago, which they took it down because of scrutiny, had on their website under what their goals and what we believe, they say, quote, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirements by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable, end quote. They exist to disrupt the nuclear family, the idea of a husband, wife, coming together, having children, and raising those children together. Still have reservations about this issue of dominance today? Let me ask you something. When you think of protests, if you think of when women are speaking out for equality, in what positions is it always for? Let me ask you, where are the picket lines for the inequality that there's more men in the garbage industry than there is women? Where is the outcry that there's more men in construction than there is women? There is none. Why? There's no power, no authority there. What do we hear today? We need more women judges. More women congressmen, more women politics, more women CEOs, more women business owners, more women leadership. And Hollywood has portrayed this better than, and they have been portrayed for many years. The husband is always portrayed as the bubbling idiot who can't get anything right. It's always messing up. And the wife is the one with all the answers and knows how to fix everything and really is the head of the household. The husband is just another big child. Not to say that we men can act childish at times. I admit it. But this is what we see. I mean, even, you know, and I know I'm probably going to get a little, some flack for mentioning Disney in a negative light, but Disney has portrayed this so much so. You think of, some of the, the new Star Wars movies. It was important, Kathleen Kennedy, who took over that franchise, said it's important that we show women in the right light. What was the right light? The new characters, Rey, she had to be the strongest of all the Jedi. Better than even Luke Skywalker. Kathleen Kennedy and, and her um, women production team all had shirts that said, the force is female. Marvel Cinematic Universe released a movie called Captain Marvel. Now, I'm a huge Star Wars and, and Marvel fan, and I love what, what they did with all these with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Loved it. But in that, it was important for Kevin Feige and the team at Marvel to portray this character, who was not portrayed in the comics this way, but portray her as what? The strongest hero there is. She has to be stronger than all the men and everyone. Why? Because this is what we need to teach our culture. <clears throat> the biblical model for marriage and the role of the husband and wife are considered archaic, outdated, and chauvinistic. And our text today would no doubt spark anger in many this sermon will be dismissed and condemned by the majority of the world today. And if there be any part of it that upsets you, let that be a testament of how far we have allowed society and our culture to indoctrinate our views. It is my desire today for us to see the beauty of God's original design for marriage as we study our text this morning. Now, today will not be an exhaustive study on this issue, for there are so many books and so many things we could say about marriage, about the role of, of the wife. My focus will be on the issue of submission. 
as I believe that is the most misunderstood and kicked against command in the Bible. We saw two weeks ago that the woman is to be an aide, a helper to her husband, and that was her primary ministry. We talked about the importance that the wife is as a perfect complement to the husband, and she is a vital member of the partnership. Today, we're going to look at how God has prescribed the wife to go about fulfilling this role. When looking at the subject of submission, we must understand how much of a vital aspect it is in marriage and in the life of a Christian. Because you cannot properly aid wives if you're too busy trying to be aided yourself. You cannot be the suitable helper to your husband if you're more concerned with him helping and aiding you, and you cannot operate as a team if you're both competing for headship. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be looking at chapter 5. The uh, book of Ephesians chapter 5, Bruce kind of went over this last week a little bit. But our texts are just three verses. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as a church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything, in everything, to their husbands. Let's pray. Father, as we open this text and dive into your word, may it be your word that is proclaimed, may it be you that speaks. Lord, we do not need to hear from me this morning. Not my views, not my opinions, not my words, but yours, God. It is why we are here, to hear from you. I think we're going to need a special dose of humility this morning as we read this text. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us to see the beauty in your design, the beauty in your creation, the beauty in the, stru- in the way you have structured everything. Lord, help us this morning to emulate these things in our lives, to bring you glory. And Father, I pray that there be anybody here that does not know you. As Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict of sin, would bring about repentance, and that you would lead them to a saving knowledge of your Son. God, thank you for this undeserved opportunity and privilege to present your word to your people. Edify us now for the exaltation of Christ. We pray and ask in his name. Amen. In our text this morning, we're going to be looking at three aspects. Three aspects. The call of submission, the reason for submission, and the example of submission. Now, to understand the concept of the wife as helper, we must establish and understand this concept of submission, which in our culture is a bad word, is it not? We hate this word, especially if you apply to women. Oh, the fire starts building up in us a little bit, does it not? <clears throat> but with an overview of Scripture, it is plain to see how important this concept is. Colossians 3.18 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. 1 Timothy 2.11, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Titus 2, 3 through 5 Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves, too much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands, and children, and to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. There could be no mistaking. This is not an isolated text. This is not something that's taken out of context. There's no getting around it. It's not only there, it's all over there. The word of God is adamant and clear on this issue. It is clear through God's design and creation, and it is clear through his prescribed 
create a word. Now let us examine first the call of submission. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now first I want us to understand something. When we talk about the word and we mention the word submission, it is not a concept for women and children alone. It is something for all those who profess Christ. The Greek word hupotasso is a military term. That's the Greek word for submit, hupotasso. And it's a military term, and it has the idea of getting in line and to voluntarily rank oneself beneath another. That's what we do in the military, right? You go in the military, you voluntarily rank yourself in under your commanders and officers, chiefs, and lieutenants, and so on, captains, so forth. I don't know the order. <clears throat> but we need to understand that submission is not for just women and children alone. It is a command and attitude to all believers. Philippians 2, 3, do, not, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 1 Peter 5, 5, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. 1 Peter 2, 3, uh, 2 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. We as Christians are to be subject to what? the government that God has put in place, whether we like them or not. There is this humility that needs to be amongst all followers of Christ. And all Christians should be characterized by humility and willingness to submit. And this is the opposite mindset of the world today, right? Everybody wants to lead. Everybody wants to have their own way. When I was younger... Um, I, was, I worked at Big Five in Sonora. And one of the slow nights, I remember the manager, she was talking about how, talking about stories of hiring and firing and all this and that. And she looked over at me and said, she said, you know what, why I hired you? And I said, no. She said, because of your answer you gave me when I asked the question, are you a leader or a follower? So you said, I hate that question. Because you naturally, everyone naturally wants to say leader but it really depends on the situation. If, it's, if someone is more capable of leading than me in a certain situation, should I not, would it not be my best interest to follow them? And if I'm more capable to lead than others, then it should be in the best interest of others if I lead. So it really depends on the situation. You said, everybody always said, oh, I'm a leader. I'm a leader, 100% I'm a leader. Not a follower, not me. If everybody is a leader, then nobody is a leader. That's why there's, there's distinctions and roles when it comes to marriage. It is to provide the idea of unity and one flesh. You cannot be moving together in the same direction when you're both attempting to lead one another. For us to understand submission, it is important that we understand what it is not. You know, we in society have this idea of when we hear submission, especially when it comes to marriage and women, we have this idea of domineering men who are um, making their wives to be like slaves and making them wear burkas and, and not allowed to drive cars. Although it is that way in some countries. Submission does not mean that women are treated as objects. It does not mean that they have no say or opinion in things. In fact, most of us men rely very heavily on the opinion of our wives, do we not? It does not mean that she shelves her abilities and talents. It does not mean that she is helpless or useless outside of the home. And it seems that many convey this idea when we talk about submission in the Word of God. But what is, let us actually look at what the Bible's idea of the good wife, a perfect wife is. I don't say perfect wife, but the ideal wife. Turn with me into uh, Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. It should be somewhere in the middle of your Bible there. Proverbs 31, starting in verse 10. 
Proverbs 31, verse 10. This is the excellent wife. It says, an excellent wife, who can find? She is more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. She will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like ships of the, of the merchant. She brings for food from afar. She rises wide as night and provides food for her household and portion for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands uh, to the uh, to staff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor. She reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, um, or for her household. For all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sash to the merchants. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She lasts at the time uh, at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the way of the household, and she does not eat bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, as he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her work praise her in the gates. Let me ask you, does that sound like a, a helpless woman, a useless woman other than raising children and, and being in the household? Does that match our society's idea when we talk about the biblical woman and her role? That last part of that text is so true. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. Now, I have a, the privilege of, and luxury of, of marrying a beautiful woman. Very pretty. And I definitely married up. My family and friends and complete strangers will remind me of that. <laughs> it's not a joke. When the external things begin to fade, though, that which I find most beautiful about her is the way she cares for me and my children and our household. And when beauty fades and, and though she will always be beautiful to me, but when the external beauty fades, that which really makes her beautiful will always remain. And that's what, is, what Paul speaks of in 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 11. He says, Likewise, also that women should not adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, or should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold and pearls and costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Submissive, submissiveness. Sorry. Paul was addressing here women who were adorning themselves with external beauty. And he says, no, 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 you adorn yourself with internal beauty, beauty that does not fade. Now, we've looked at what submission is not. Let's understand what, uh, get an idea of what biblical submission does look like. The key to answering this question is found at the end of this verse, in verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 5. It says, submit to your own husbands as to what? The Lord. Submit to him as you would to the Lord. It is an act of her will and not based upon her feelings or her husband's worthiness. The, this correlates to a wife's service to the husband in the area of being a suitable helper. She serves the Lord by aiding her husband in fulfilling his service to the Lord. Again, this promotes one flesh and unity. A perfect, a perfect example of this is a sermon that you're hearing now. I could not present to you the sermon that I'm giving you this morning if I had to work all week, come home, take care of the children, cook, clean, get them ready for bed, and do all the things that my wife does. You know, it's, 
when people ask how much time I put into the sermons, you know, they're really shocked. Um, and I, I think maybe Anne and Rachel and Lily, they understand. Um, there's 30 plus hours that goes into a sermon prep. A lot of reading, a lot of research, a lot of typing, deleting, retyping, deleting, retyping. And every time I preach, every time I tell Lily, I'm, I got it down this, this week. I'm going to be done early. I'm going to be done quick. And it never fails. I'm up to 3 to 4 o'clock in the morning on Saturday night. And people say, wow, that's crazy. That's a lot of time. But what they fail to recognize is that that's a lot of time that my wife has had to pick up the slack around the house so that I could do those things. But she serves the Lord by serving me in that way. And although she had no part in writing it, Lily was a very instrumental uh, part of this sermon and every sermon that I preach. And she's never once thought selfishly when it comes to the things that I get for when I preach. She doesn't think twice about how if it weren't for her doing what she does, I couldn't have done, a, you know, written the sermon. She genuinely is happy when I do well and succeed in these things. Why? Because we're one flesh. My success is her success. And it's not my service to the Lord, but our service to the Lord. As to the Lord, this gives us an idea as to the attitude. The attitude in which a wife is to submit. This shows that submission is not a trait to be developed, but an attitude of the heart. The motivation behind our submission to the Lord is not fear. It is not obligation or duty. We delight in our submission to the Lord. We delight, and it is out of a reverent love for God, a reverent or respect, deep respect. This is the motivation behind a wife's submission to her husband, a loving respect. Notice the last sentence in this paragraph, and, and if you look at chapter 5, the end, um, verse 33, it says, however, let each one of you, talking to husbands, Let's, each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Interesting right there that Paul does not say, and wives love your husbands. Why? Because love and respect go hand in hand. Respect proceeds romantic love. A woman will not love a man that she does not respect. Nor will she submit to a man whom she does not love. And respect. The moment that a woman loses respect for her husband is the moment that her love for her husband begins to fade, is it not? And then the moment that a man does not feel respected by his wife, his love for her is replaced with resentment. It is astonishing how many marriages struggle. And many, many struggling marriages have this one complaint. From the wife, he does not love me anymore. And from the husband, I don't feel respected by my wife anymore. Paul, Paul here, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, hits the nail on the head 2,000 years ago for marriage counseling. Wives, respect does not mean revamping him changing him or conforming him to the image that you think it should be. That is the job of the Holy Spirit if he is a believer. And he is way better at it than you are. Respect, like submission, is an inward attitude that is displayed in outward works. Want a sure way of making your husband not feel respected and loved? Question him in all that he does. Undermine his decisions. Make big, big decisions without him. Nag and complain all the time about every aspect of him or your living situation together. Demean him to others. Never compliment or thank him. These are sure ways husbands will quickly feel their love for their wives dissipate. 
Another aspect of why submitting to their husbands as unto the Lord is trust. Is it not? We are willing to submit to God because we have placed our trust in him. I said two weeks ago that the most important foundation stones of a good marriage is that of trust. You cannot have a healthy relationship with someone whom you do not trust. When a wife submits herself to a leadership of her husband, she is demonstrating her trust in him and demonstrating her trust in the Lord and her trust in the sovereignty of God to lead them through whatever situations they face through the leadership and headship of her husband. When a wife willingly submits herself to God's design of marriage, she is trusting God to lead her through whatever life brings. And a wife's submission, says here in the text, is to her own husband. Women are not to be submissive to other men or their husbands. The text deals directly with the marriage relationship. That was Paul's desire here. Now, before we move on to our, our next point, I want us to notice something here in this verse. Look at verse 22. Who is Paul addressing there? First word. Wives, wives, submit to your own husband. Notice that it does not say here, husbands, ensure your wives submit to you. Notice that it does not say, husbands, it is your duty to make sure your wife submits to you. The call of submission is a call from the Lord to the wife, not the husband. Husband, it is not your duty to ensure that your wife submits to you. Why? Because I said before, submission is an attitude of the heart. It is not something that you can make her do. You might get obedience, but obedience is not submission. Submission is an attitude of the heart. And it doesn't even say that husbands are to point this out to them. It's funny how some men are so ignorant of the Bible, but they know this verse. They're very aware of this verse. But husbands, you are not to even point this out to them. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that men are to do this and husbands are to do this. Trust me. Wives are aware of it. If she's not submitting to you, it's not because she forgot. Telling her is not going to fix the problem. She is to submit as to the Lord. And if she refuses to do this, your obligation, husband, is to love her regardless. Let the Lord deal with stubbornness and disobedience. Now, we're going to move from the call of submission to the reason for submission. Verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its Savior. The reason for submission, as we see in this text, is because of order, not value. The reason a wife is to submit to her husband as the head of the household is because of order, not value or superiority. <clears throat> Paul says, First um, Corinthians, First Corinthians, chapter eleven, verse three. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Head of Christ is God. If we're about value and superiority, then this verse would imply that Jesus and the Father are not equal. And we know that Scripture does not teach that. God the Father and Son are equal, yet the Father is the head of Christ, and he sends him into the world to do his will, and the Son joyfully submits to the will of the Father. Luke 22, 42, John 4, 34. And why is it the joy of the Son to submit to the will of the Father? Because they are one. In the same way, a wife can rejoice in the submission to her husband, headship, because they are what? One flesh. 
The submission of a wife in no way implies inferiority. Instead, it teaches the, necess the, necess the necessary order and structure for division and responsibility within the home. Every institution, this is not a foreign concept to us, is it not? Every institution has this. In government, we have different branches of authority. In, in schools, we have you know, different branches of authority. You have deans and principals and vice principals and, and teachers and students. You have a level of authority. In, in work, in management, you have levels of authority. You have CEOs. You have, you have managers. You have assistant managers. You have assistants to the regional managers. You have all those. Employees, you have levels. You have different levels of authority. This is not a foreign concept to us. Every institution has this, including that of marriage. And if this, and without this framework, these distinctions, without these roles, you have disorder and chaos. Genesis 3, good example. I would love to say that I came up with this, but I didn't. I stole this from Vodi Bakum. Um, but it was too good not to tell. Genesis 3, what happens? The fall, right? Adam and Eve stand against God. When the creative order, God says what to Adam? He makes Adam and he gives him dominion over the animals, over everything, right? He gives the woman to Adam for him to have headship over her and she is to share this responsibility of having headship over the animals and to guard and tend, uh, to tend and protect and keep the garden, right? What happens at the fall? Satan comes in the form of a serpent, a creature, deceives Eve, thus exercising authority over her. Eve tempts her husband and leads him astray, thus exercising authority over him. And Adam eats and sins against God in an attempt to be like him, trying to exercise dominions over God. The order is flipped. What was the result? Sin, death. Because Adam did not exercise his headship and do what he was supposed to do, sin and death entered the world. Can we get an idea how important this concept is? Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, listen to this, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where, it is no law, where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even though over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. What does the text not say there? Sin entered to the world through the transgression of a couple. Who was it that was first deceived? And who was it that, that led Adam into deception? Was it not Eve? Yet, it is Adam that bears the responsibility. It is on Adam that the blame falls. Why? Because he did not, did not exercise his headship. Did not lead as he was, to, as he was supposed to. Just has a, a warehouse or store manager. If the store or warehouse is doing badly, has bad numbers and doesn't meet the quota, who is it that gets the ax? The manager. Even if the employees are partly to blame, their responsibility falls on the authoritative headship. The analogy given is that of Christ being the head of the church, his body and his is himself its savior, the text says. Christ's relationship with the church is to be the, the husband's model. 
This is further laid out in verses 25 through 33. With the headship there, it is an act of involvement. Christ does not just rule over the church in a dominating way. He gives himself to her and protects her. Husbands, the headship you have is not an excuse for you to be lazy. It's not an excuse to make your wife do everything around the house. And it's not an excuse for you to take advantage of your wife. With the headship comes responsibilities to sacrificially love your wife. Give of yourself to her and to protect her physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. You know, this verse right here flies in the face of uh, egalitarianism, which basically is crept into the church, uh, which that teaches just that basically there are no distinct roles, that Adam and Eve were, were created um, to have no distinction in their roles, uh, all have equal, both have equal headship, and when the fall came, came this idea of domineering headship and was not a part of the original design. And now that Christ has come, we can get back to God's original design, which is equal headship, and there is no roles or distinction in between a husband and wife. This verse, fly, Galatians 3.28, where it says there is no uh, Greek, nor, nor Jew, nor female, nor male. Um, that is the verse that they go to for, for this view. But this verse here flies in the face of that, does it not? If if there is no distinction in roles, then the example that Paul gives is Christ is the head of the church means that the church is just as equal with Christ. And there is no distinction in roles and headship there. But Paul is saying the exact opposite here. And this is the reason for submission. So we've looked at the call. We've looked at the reason for submission. Now we're going to examine our third and final point, the example of submission. Verse 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. What is the scope of a wife's submission? What is the scope? The same as a church's scope of submission to Christ. In everything. Now, we don't like that. We'll, we'll sing songs of I surrender all, but I don't want to actually do it, Lord. I don't want to actually submit to what your word says. I don't want to actually surrender my views, my desires. The church does not get to pick and choose when, where, and how it's going to serve Christ. And submit to Christ. The church submits in all things at all times and in all ways. Notice the stipulation that Paul gives here, though. I don't see it. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also why submit in everything to their husbands? Where's the unless? Where's the ifs? There is no condition. There is no clause. There is no proviso here. Wives, submit. Respect your husbands. And husbands, love your wives regardless of what the other one is doing. Unfortunately, we may think we can add our own stipulation then, and we don't have to fulfill our duty if the other party is not fulfilling their end of the bargain. It's why divorce is so rampant in our culture today. Now, don't get me wrong. The only time that this is not to be fulfilled is if um, a husband is asked his wife to commit acts of sin. A wife's first priority and duty is to the Lord. Uh, scripture does not obligate a wife to endure physical abuse or sexual unfaithfulness or sexual abuse. Both are a violation of the husband's covenantal agreement and is well within the right of a wife to seek and get outside help in such situations. Um, it is a wife's responsibility as a sister in Christ to confront and, and lovingly correct her husband in any sin that he may be committing. So I don't want to get the idea that in promoting that, you know, women are to stay with abusive spouses. But get back to the question, how is a wife to submit to her husband? 
in the same way the church submits to Christ. Now, how does the church submit to Christ? By first and foremost acknowledging his authority. The church submits to Christ by first and foremost acknowledging his authority in their lives. It is the one that acknowledges and submits to Christ's authority in their lives. That is the true church, right? And that is Paul's point here. And we kind of miss that because what I've done this morning is kind of opposite of what we usually do, right? We usually take a text in all of its context and preach through that. Um, because of this series, I've isolated the text. But if we look at the context of, of Paul's letters to the Ephesians, if we look uh, a few verses up, we can get a, a deeper understanding of, of what Paul is doing here, of what Paul is saying. You see, from verses 15 to chapter 6, verse 9, Paul gives three sets of three. Three commands, three con, con, I'm sorry, three contrasts, three commands, and three contexts. Each one leading to the other. Look with me at verse 15. Give you a little bit of context and it will deepen our understanding of what Paul is saying here. He says, look carefully then how you are to walk, not as wise, but as wise. Contrast number one, don't walk as unwise, but wise making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Verse 17, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Contrast number two, don't be foolish, know what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Contrast number three, don't get drunk with wine, be filled instead with the Spirit. That begs the question as to how. How is one to be filled with the Spirit? Now we have our commands, three commands. <clears throat> How is one to be filled with the Spirit? By addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Command number one, be a worshiper of God. Verse 20, giving thanks always for everything to God, the Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Be content and thankfully prayerful. Or prayerfully thankful. Command number two. And then we have... Command number three, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That leads to our three contexts. What's the three contexts of submission? Wives to husbands, children to parents, slaves to masters, or workers to bosses, if you will. Now, what is Paul saying here? What are we, what are we getting at? Paul's instructing the Ephesian believers, and how they are to conduct their lives for Christ. A church is a church only if they have submitted themselves to Christ as the authority in their lives. You want a great measuring rod in determining if a wife or anybody, for that matter, is submitted to Christ? Look in their lives and see, are they submitting to the proper authorities that God has prescribed in his word? In other words, show me a woman or a wife who refuses to submit to her husband, and I'll show you one who is probably not submitting to Christ. If you have a hard time submitting to the headship of your husband, the problem may not, may not be your relationship with your husband, but your relationship with God. It is my guess that you most likely have issues with submitting in other areas and to other authorities as well. Paul is saying here, wives, show that you are submitted to Christ by submitting yourself to the proper authorities that, I, that God has prescribed. In doing so, you model the church's relationship to Christ. He says, be that example that others can point to and say, the way that she is toward her husband, that is a perfect example of how we, the church, should be acting toward Christ. Which leads me to my application. What is the Apostle Paul's desire here to these Ephesian believers that he's writing to? Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Paul's not giving a recipe here 
to husbands or wives on how to have a better marriage. He's not giving a, a three-step program on how to have a happier, more fulfilled, more prosperous, prosperous marriage. That's not his desire here. And that's not our desire in giving this series. These commands are not given for self-fulfillment and happiness. These commands and instructions are given for the purpose of instructing believers on how they are to imitate Christ in their lives. And relationship to one another, especially marriage. A Christian wife's submission to her husband models the church submission to Christ. But what does it also model? Christ himself. You see, the idea of submission goes, goes against our very nature, doesn't it? It goes against our culture and what society teaches. And that is the point. That is the point. The world says that for wives to be equal, they must have authority equal to that of the husband. But what did Jesus say? But whoever would be great among you must be a servant, and whoever would be first among you must be a slave. Even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 26-28. Jesus overturns this idea of, of greatness, that one must be in charge to be significant. Jesus demonstrated his greatness by what? Becoming a servant. He submitted himself to the will of the Father by submitting his by submitting to his earthly parents, by submitting to, to local governments, paying taxes even, by submitting himself to the law, by submitting himself to man, being handed over even to cross, to the cross. When wives submit to their husbands, they model who? They emulate who? Christ. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. And let me give you words of encouragement. And the world says that wives, you know, you, you should want more out of life than becoming a mother and a housewife. More significance in life. Get more out of life, not just being a housewife and mom. Let me tell you something right now. There is no more significant of a job that you can have than that. There's no more of a significant job than you, you can have than being at home with your children and raising your children, the future of this world. That is what they need. They don't need to have a career mom. They don't need to have a big house. They don't need to have two working parents who who bring home a lot of money and go on nice vacations. What they need is parents who fit the role that God has prescribed for them. And it is a significant, important job. And the world keeps pressing us to let others raise our children. You go do you. You go fulfill your desires. You go have your dreams. We'll take care of your children. Let the government do it. Now, I know that some, it's hard to do that, and, and your situation that you're in uh, doesn't allow this, but it should be your desire. Now, I know that for some, it is, it is hard to submit, not because you're unwilling to submit, but because you are married to a man that is hard to respect and therefore hard to submit to. But it is when out of a desire to please God that you still show him the honor, respect, and submission that he knows 
he doesn't deserve. It is when that you have to dig down deep. When it's hard and you don't want to. When he's least deserving of it. It is then that you emulate Christ the most. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 2. Wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see respectful and pure conduct. But even if he doesn't, even if he may never acknowledge anything that you do, even if he never loves and appreciates you, even if he never notices any of it, may I encourage you with this. You have a Father in Heaven who does. And He calls you precious in His sight when you do these things. 1 Peter 3, 4. Hang in there. I want to end with a word to husbands. I know, this is supposed to be for women only, right? Thought you were going to get away. Husbands. Are you being the leader in your household? Or are you passing your responsibilities over to your wife? Do you just say, I work and do my job and that's all I have to do? Being the head of the household means more than providing a paycheck. You are to be leading your wife and children in all ways, especially spiritually I am sick and tired of seeing households that are spiritually ran by the wife because of laziness of husbands who do not take their role and responsibility seriously Do you lead them as God has called you to lead them? Do you encourage them in the things of the Lord? Do you teach them his statutes? Do you yourself set the spiritual model in your household? Do you serve God as you should? Do you fulfill this role in your life and in your marriage? Don't forget that as the head of the household, you will have to give an account to the Lord one day as to how good of a steward you were with all that he's entrusted to you, including your wife and kids. Wives will find it hard to submit to a husband that does not act or take his role serious. And let me ask one last question. How easy is it for your wife to submit to you? I want you to do me a favor. Think of, think of one of the best bosses or managers you've ever had. What made them great? For me, when I look back at some of the best bosses and managers I ever had, it was the ones who were in the trenches with me. It was the ones who would come alongside me and help. It was the ones who would, even though it wasn't their job, Come alongside me and say, what do you need from me? Who long to help make me successful in doing my job. They weren't too good to pick up a broom and sweep. They weren't too good to take out the garbage, clean the toilet, They were the ones who would do things that wasn't technically their job, like I said. They, the ones that needed. And, and here's the thing, too. Those are the bosses that on Saturdays, when they wanted something from me, it was my privilege to do it. I need someone to work on a Saturday. Can you help me out? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have to, I, I feel obligated to because of what all that you do for me, absolutely. 
Part of loving your wife as Christ loved the church means loving her sacrificially, coming alongside of her and asking her what she needs. And it may require at times to do things that aren't technically your job. If we as husbands love and lead our wives in this way, I am willing to bet they will have no problem submitting to a husband like that. And thus, the relationship between Christ and the church is beautifully portrayed to a watching world. May we desire to portray this to this world. Wives to husbands, husbands to wives.